Hi team, welcome back. Just giving you a quick overview now that you've read chapter five in the book, I want to talk to you a bit about lipids, specifically about fish and omega-3 uh, and omega-6 fatty acids and what those things really mean, where you can find them. And more than anything, you know, you've read the chapter, so I'm not going to go through a lot of that material. Instead, I just want to supplement what the book says to give you some additional information, where to find it, what things really mean and how they can impact your health. So the book really does a good job breaking down different fatty acids. It talks about different lipids. It talks about cholesterol. We'll touch base on that in a second. And they also talk, talk, touch base on triglycerides, which I'll cover. I do just want to take a few minutes with you just to go over again what these different things are, just around the same page when we start having that conversation on omega-3s and omega-6s. So we can see at the top here, um, at the top group here on this picture that's actually in your book as well, we can see there's something called a saturated fatty acid. Now, any fatty acid, we call it that because it's got this acid group on the side. The acid group is called a carboxylic fatty acid, or, or I'm sorry, it's a carboxylic acid. So it's got that COOH design on it. And that's going to be the uh, alpha side of any fatty acid. And then we have the omega side, which ends with something called a methyl group. The methyl group is just the CH3. So again, for this class, I'm not really interested in you memorizing things like carbons and hydrogens and where they're located. I do think you should know alpha versus omega, though, and I'll give you some examples of this in a few minutes. But back to our conversation here, this is called a saturated fatty acid because we see after the acid group, it's saturated with hydrogens. So this is a quick recollection. A carbon at any time can have uh, four different um, atoms that it can bind with as long as they're uh, single bonds. And we can see here, for example, with this carbon is one, two, three, four. So it's binding also with that or bonding with that carbon. With this carbon, it's one, two, three, four. So again, there's always four bonds here. In this case, though, every available carbon, we see that it's filled up with hydrogen bonds. That's what we call saturated. So it's saturated with those H's or those hydrogens. That's not the same as we see with our unsaturated fatty acids. So there's different, two different categories here. We have the mono unsaturated. Mono means one. So we see here, just between two carbons, there's only one link here. So that's what makes it the one link. And we see here, it's not saturated with fatty acids anymore. In fact, if we come from the omega side, we see this is called an omega-9. If we look further down, we see polyunsaturated, poly meaning more than one place where there's not going to be saturated with hydrogen. So we see here, again, kind of from the omega side, one, two, three back, that first carbon, that's going to be our omega-3 because from the omega side, it's the third carbon back that is missing uh, a saturated bond point. Here on this bottom one in section D, we see one, two, three, four, five, six carbons back. The first place is where you always count from. From the omega side, we see this is an omega-6 because here the sixth carbon is not saturated with hydrogen ions or hydrogen atoms, I'm sorry. So we can see here actually three different types of omegas, the omega-3, the omega-6, the omega-9 that we never hear about. Uh, the reason we never hear about omega-9 is your body makes omega-9 on its own. It doesn't need it from an outside source, whereas the omega-3s and the omega-6s, you need that external source to be able to make this, uh, to be able to have this fatty acid component within your body. and has lots of different roles, which we're going to go over in a little bit. I do want to bring your attention to uh, this picture right here, and we can see this is a supplement you could buy in a store. And, you know, one of the things that we talked a lot about in this class is how supplements and vitamin supplements aren't really necessary unless it's prescribed by a doctor because of a certain condition, so for example, pregnancy, osteoporosis. That makes it completely different. But this product will definitely be sold to you. We can see here this is a fixed flax and borage product. It has omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that, as we just learned, why would they include the omega-9? Omega-9 is something that your body can make on its own. Okay, So you have the enzymes in your body that are capable of taking a fatty acid and unsaturating it on that ninth carbon. So omega-9s, you can make them yourselves. So why are they including it here? One of the reasons they're including it here is that if you go into a store and you see two different supplements, one has omega-3 and omega-6, and another one has omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9. You may be inclined to buy the one that says omega-3, omega-6, omega-9 simply because you're like, oh, it has more. But what you don't realize is that your body actually makes that. So this is actually what we would call a marketing scheme. So they're including one more thing just with the idea, again, that maybe, you know, it'll help their sales. But you actually don't need that in a product. And what we're really going to be focusing on in this PowerPoint lecture is the idea that you don't need these supplements to begin with. You can get good cal um, omega sources from fish or even from an algae supplement, if that's the way you need to go, or from, for example, um, walnuts and other uh, nice uh, you know, dried fruits. So when we talk about our fatty acids, if we look up here at this picture right here, we can see the one fatty acid. But typically, the way fatty acids are brought into the body is as something called a triglyceride. And I just wanted to touch base on triglyceride for one second because we hear the word thrown around a lot. And what does that really mean? 
It just means we have something called a glycerol backbone. So this three carbon unit right here, this is called a glycerol backbone. And attached to that, we can see there's three different fatty acids. They're different. They don't need to be the same. They can be different types of fatty acids. But together, since there's three, we would call this a triglyceride. Up here, since there's only one fatty acid attached to the glycerol backbone, we'd call this a monoglyceride. And if there was another example here, which we don't have, but there were two fatty acids attached to a glycerol backbone, we would call that a diglyceride. So again, we can see the monoglyceride for one, di for two, meaning diglyceride, or tri for three, meaning diglyceride. Um, interestingly, down here, I just want to point this out for a second. We see that these first two fatty acids, would these be saturated or unsaturated? Well, if you assume they're saturated, you know they're, un they're saturated, you're correct, because you can see they're saturated with hydrogens. This bottom one, is this saturated or unsaturated? Well, again, if you said unsaturated, you'd be correct. And if we count back, we can actually identify what omega group it is. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is an omega-9 fatty acid. Can your body make it on its own? Yes, it can, because the only essential fatty acids for the omega groups are omega-3 and omega-6. So hopefully with that little bit of review, you feel a little more confident on what omega-3, omega-6 is and what triglyceride is. I do want to touch base on sterols for a second because they're very important, especially one that's been demonized. Uh, specifically cholesterol. So cholesterol is very different as far as a fatty acid or a lipid goes for sterols. They're different than fatty acids where fatty acids look like this. Sterols are going to have a multi-ring structure. I'm going to show you cholesterol in a second. They're sort of waxy. Uh, you make cholesterol yourself. You make cholesterol in your liver. So if you ever have a day where you're deficient in cholesterol, your liver makes up for that on its own. Here's the important thing. Cholesterol is only found in animal foods. Plants, do not make cholesterol. Only animals make cholesterol. So you're only going to find cholesterol in animal products. But if you look here down here, this is Cousin Willie's original popcorn. And we can see here Cousin Willie is pointing out there's no cholesterol in his product. Well, why would he say that? Again, it's a marketing perspective. They're going to write down the word no cholesterol because they think if people see that, they may be more likely to buy that than the competitors that doesn't bring it up. But what you know from this class now is that if it's plant-based foods, there is no cholesterol there. Because plants, they make a different sterol that's called phytosterol. And phyto means plant, and sterol is your ring structure again. So phytosterol means plant sterol. Cholesterol, in this case, means from an animal source. Now, most people try to stay away from cholesterol. They think it's a bad thing. But in reality, cholesterol is extremely important for your body. So as we can see here on the right, we can see this is that multi-ring structure that is the sterol, in this case, cholesterol. What people don't realize is without cholesterol, your body would not be able to function. So every single cell has a membrane. Cholesterol is embedded in the cell membrane of every cell in your body. Without it, the cell membrane would have a lot more rigidity. It wouldn't function properly, and that'd be the end of your life. So cholesterol, just from that perspective, the cell membrane perspective is important. But we can go more in depth. If we look down here from cholesterol, cholesterol is the backbone and the base for making testosterone. It's also the base for making estrogen. So cholesterol is taken into the body or made by our liver to make different hormones that function in the body. Even more so, there's another hormone here, vitamin D. We call vitamin D a vitamin, but it functions as a hormone in the body. It helps it cap, um, actually capture and encapsulate calcium into the bone structure. And we can see down here vitamin D2 and vitamin D3, again, are based off of that cholesterol backbone. So without cholesterol, in fact, we're in really bad shape. So we always hear the word about how bad cholesterol is for us, but what we've learned with nutrition, what we learned through science, is that cholesterol is essential to the human body, and without it, we wouldn't be able to function properly. Now, one thing I'd like to do, which is uh, now really deviating from the book, but it's something that always comes up, is people ask about fats and different sources in the supermarket. So I want to show you how milk compares. We always talk about 1% milk, 2% milk. What does that mean? Um, so I went into the supermarket, and I took a bunch of pictures of different uh, milk products and alternative milk sources. because I wanted you to be aware of what they mean when they say 1%, 2%, but even more so, how much calcium is in those products. This is very important because one of the main reasons we consume milk is not just to get calories and energy, but it's really to get calcium into the body. So let's take a look at the different uh, data I found. So the first thing is 2%, 1%, fat-free. It doesn't exactly mean what you think it means. 2% milk means the whole volume of the container only contains 2% milk. But if we look at the overall amount of calorie content, going back to chapters 1 and 2 and breaking that sort of information down, we can see the 2% milk doesn't mean there's only 2% of an overall amount of fat towards energy. It actually means a lot more. 
So we can see here on the left-hand side, whole milk has eight grams of fat. That means that for the calorie content, about 48% of all calories in whole milk is coming from fat. For 2% milk, since there's five grams of fat, 35% of all calories in that product are coming from fat. For the fat-free, we see since there's zero grams, zero percent, so that's fine. Heavy cream, it's 100% fat, it's five grams, so it's all fat. That's where all the uh, calories come from in that product. And then if we look at the smart balance, there's one gram of fat, so there's actually 9% fat in that product. Now look at the top, this is important. This is the calcium content. So we can see with the calcium content with whole milk, fat-free, reduced fat, and even the smart balance, they have about 30% to 35% calcium, that's good. Look at the heavy cream. Sometimes people get confused when they see heavy cream or half and half, and they're like, oh, this is a good source of calcium. In fact, it's not. You can see here there's only about 2% of it um, that actually has, it's only 2% of the recommended dietary allowance of calcium. So it's very low, it's a non-calcium source. Here's some alternatives for you I looked up as well. Rice milk. Rice milk has about 16% fat when you break down the numbers. It still has calcium. Coconut milk, 100% fat from, uh, from the calorie content. Very low calcium, so not very good for you. Almonds. Almonds are a natural source of calcium. We can see it's very high in fat, but it's got a good overall calcium content. And now here's two different soy milks. Here's one that's the original silk soy milk. It has 33% fat, but it's got a lot of added sugars. So this product, if possible, try to avoid it. Instead, go with like the uh, soy milk that's unsweetened. The unsweetened doesn't have, you can see here, all natural evaporated cane juice. Here it goes from soy milk directly down to calcium carbonate. So that's your calcium source. Um, so there's no added sugars here. So it's 44% fat. There's a little more fat to give it a good taste, but at the same time, it doesn't have that added sugar. You can see these are also very good sources of calcium because they've been fortified with calcium. Finally, we can see what sweetened versus unsweetened does to a product, and this is why I think you really want to go with the unsweetened when you can. Um, Almond Breeze Original, unsweetened, zero grams of sugar added. But if we look at almond milk, original or vanilla, you know, a lot of times we go in the store, we think to ourselves, well, I'll just grab the original or even the vanilla flavored. These have a lot of added sugars, okay? And as we're gonna be learning, and as you already read through the carbohydrate section, the added sugars can be very deleterious to your health. They can mess with insulin levels, they can lead to diabetes. Um, so again, when trying to select these products, it's definitely fine to go for an alternative uh, milk source. In fact, it's something we do in my house, we drink so, um, soy milk, but at the same time, try to go for the unsweetened product. Otherwise, you're adding on a lot of extra calories and a lot of added sugars, which can be deleterious to your health. Um, another thing to always make sure that you do if you are picking an alternative uh, you know, milk source, do check to make sure that it's got about 30% calcium added to it. If it doesn't, for example, as we saw before with the coconut milk, where it's very, very low, uh, it's actually not really considered a high calcium source to be deleterious to your health. Not so good for you. Look at what we see here, what we can do with orange juice as well. So with orange juice, we can see calcium on a normal uh, orange juice not added. But when you select your orange juice, you could actually simply grab instead of the regular orange juice, grab one that's been fortified or enriched with calcium. So we see here with this orange juice, 35% calcium, excellent. Uh, coconut water, no calcium, 3%, very low, not gonna help you out. Cheeses, when we pick our cheeses up at the supermarket, you gotta make sure you're not buying sandwich slices, you have to buy something that says that it is made with real cheese. It makes a huge difference. We see here with the cheese singles, we see that it's made from partially hydrogenated soybean oil, so it's an oil, it's a fatty acid source. It's been um, given what we call a trans uh, factor to it. So it's been switched from a cis fatty acid to a trans fatty acid to give it the shape that, and structure that you want, uh, but there's no calcium here, okay? So, but if we look at the reduced fat singles, we've gotten rid of a lot of the fat. There's still quite a bit, but we do have calcium and that's what we're aiming for again. So when we take in hard cheeses, uh, soft cheeses don't typically have much calcium added to them, but uh, hard cheeses typically do. Uh, so you want to stick with those sort of products. Don't go with the, uh, you know, a little bit cheaper products, for example, these uh, oil-based singles. Now, the take home I want you to understand here is not to be afraid of fats or sugars, uh, you know, especially when we find them in milks or soy milks, even if it's added, you really need the calcium, okay? So one of the main reasons we do this, even when we think back to cereal, one of the main pushes for cereal way back when, when we first started uh, feeding it to children was not to get them the calories, it was to get milk into their bodies because people usually add uh, milk to cereal. So it's just one way of getting the, the milk inside. So therefore the calcium is uh, gonna get inside of a child as well, which, which they really, really need with those growing bones. And we do too as adults, to be honest with you, as we'll cover um, in the next module. 
But keep in mind, fat is not bad. Fat is just one thing that you're going to be taking in as part of your diet. You need it as a component of your diet. You need cholesterol, all right? But at the same time, we want to avoid saturated fats. Saturated fats come from animal products. And try to avoid any product that has added sugars. So again, thinking back to the almond milk, the soy milk, you can buy the unsweetened uh, product. Tastes very good. It's something you have to acclimate to the same as anything else. But it's going to avoid for you immediately saturated fats because it's a plant-based source. So it's got phytosterols instead. And if it's unsweetened, then it doesn't have those added sugars, which are also bad for you. Okay, so let's take a few minutes here and dive into the essential fatty acids and why we really need these omega-3s and omega-6s. So omega-3s and omega-6s are essential for us. And we say they're essential in our diet because we can't make them ourselves. Okay, so you just don't have the enzymes in your body uh, to make these two different groups, omega-3s and omega-6s. There's something else that doesn't have these enzymes, and those are fish. Fish also do not have the capability of making omega-3s and omega-6s. So through evolution, from the time of fish until now, we have that same knock-on effect. So since we came originally from fish, which evolved into amphibians, et cetera, reptiles, and then eventually led to us with mammals, we can see here again, we have the same essential fatty acid uh, structures as fish do. Fish actually get their essential fatty acids from algae. So that's where the omega-3s and omega-6s start. So if you are a, uh, you know, uh, for example, a vegetarian or a vegan and you're avoiding fish, you can take an omega-3, omega-6 algae supplement because that's where the fish get it from as well. Omega-3s are going to come from fish oils. Omega-6s, you can find these in vegetable oils. You can see they're broken into two different great groups, the DHAs, the EPAs, and arachidonic acid. I'm going to show these to you in a second. We can see here sources up here, walnuts, flax seeds, et cetera. Uh, soybean oil has some omega-3s in it as well. Um, and you're going to want to do a ratio between omega-3s and omega-6s. I'm going to point that out later. We already went over this a little bit earlier in this lecture. You can see that alpha and the omega and count back one, two, three. That's omega-3. And then one, two, three, four, five, six. That's our omega-6. Why do we want them? Okay, so if we look at the omega-6s, this is going to be one does one and the other does the other. So we see with the omega-6s, they increase blood, pl blood clotting. In other words, they increase inflammation. Omega-3s do the opposite. They decrease inflammation. They decrease things like blood uh, clotting, reduce heart attack. Uh, it, it may have different effects as well. So it's basically a push and pull, you know, game between omega-3s and omega-6s. They help your blood and the blood vessels work properly with inflammatory responses, clotting when it needs to happen, um, reducing clotting when it needs to happen. And that's why we need them as part of our diet. If we see they're not part of our diet, we can get things like flaky, itchy skin, diarrhea, onset of infections because your immune system can't work properly, fluid growth, wound healing is slowed as well. Uh, you don't need to take in these omega-3s and omega-6s every day. You can take them in about two to three times a week. It's all you need because we're actually able to store them a little bit in the body as well. I want to finish talking about omega-3s and omega-6s with the things that are most important to you. And that is what are good sources of them? So again, you could take a supplement, but in, in reality, there's a lot of really, really good fish out there that have good levels of omega-3s, uh, good levels of omega-6s if you need it. But remember, we're focused on the omega-3s right now. And uh, if we look at this list, this was published by U.S. News, but it came from different recommendations from CDC, et cetera. We can see here 11 fish that are listed as good sources of omega-3s. What do all these different fishes and uh, bivalves, like we see the oysters down here, have in common? They're all cold water fish. Cold water fish is the key. If you want a good omega-3 source, stick with the cold water fish, or what we usually say, the fish that Grandpa and Grandma used to know about. So all these new fish that have started flooding the market, like guapia, uh, you know, rainbow fish in these different ways, these warm water fish, these tropical fish, we're not seeing as good omega-3 values in them. Stick with the, the ones we know about. Salmon, mackerel, sardines, excellent source. Anchovies, delicious and good for you. Uh, trout, tuna even is a very good source of omega-3s. So it's the fish that, when you think back into the early 1900s, it's fish that we were more familiar with especially in the northeastern United States because of where we're located and what we were fishing at those times. So we know fish are good for us. We know omega-3s are essential for us. But what about all that mercury? Well, there are fish that are higher in mercury, and it's the fish that are predators themselves, which are always going to be higher in mercury content. So we can see here what we're actually interested in is something called methylmercury. So it's got a methyl group. Remember that CH3 attached to the mercury uh, element itself. And we can see who's high in it. Swordfish, shark, king mackerel, tilefish. You should never consume those four fish. Swordfish, shark, king mackerel, tilefish, they're all out. 
Okay, they shouldn't be part of a diet. They're very high in methylmercury, um, and that can help you. Albacore tuna is also somewhat high in mercury, but it's somewhat lower. You can see here over on this right, this is from the Bureau of Health, and we can see fish you buy, fish you catch, and look at the mercury levels. You see here shark, swordfish, very high. Uh, salmon, very low. Flatfish, flounder, very low. Cod, excellent for you, very low. Shellfish, very low. And it's because these are bottom of the food chain type fish. But as we move up in the food chain and we go towards, for example, tuna, which eats smaller fish, it goes up in, in amount. Albacore tuna, which is typically considered the more elitist, if you'd want to say, uh, tuna, it's actually not as good for you as canned light tuna. Canned light tuna is typically the one you want to look for, especially a certain type called skipjack. Skipjack is the lowest mercury content amongst the tuna that you can find. Um, and again, this comes into play a lot for everybody, but it comes most important when we talk about young children, when we talk about pregnant women, because again, that methylmercury can get into a growing or developing fetus. And with children, they just don't have a lot of mass to offset the effects of the methylmercury as well. And it bioaccumulates more. Here's a picture of albacore tuna. So we always think, why would tuna be so high? This is a tuna. Tuna are huge fish. We don't think about it because it comes in a can to us usually, but they're huge fish. And that means they're consuming a lot of small fish to get to be that size. So the mercury bioaccumulates in them. I'm going to show you what this looks like in a little bit, such as right here. So we can see down here on the lower left-hand side, we can see what bioaccumulation means. Basically, what happens is mercury is partly our fault. Elemental mercury has been, uh, you know, used by different incinerators, fossil fuel burning, makes that elemental mercury, falls into the water. And once that elemental mercury gets into the water, first it's ingested by bacteria, algae, et cetera, gets in them. Small fish eat those bacteria and algae, and then larger fish eat those, those fish. And so this would be the tuna here. And then even above that, you would see, for example, a shark, something like that. So we can see bioaccumulation keeps on accumulating because these guys ate a little bit of this, these guys eat a lot of these, and they get more and more of that mercury building up inside them. The thing to keep in mind, of course, is again, you need those omega-3. So it's a hypothetical mercury risk. There's a lot of really, really good things about fish that are good for us. Um, here's a nice list for you. Okay, so you can see this by the Washington State Department of Health. Two to three meals per week. Avoid. What do we see again? Shark, tilefish, swordfish, king mackerel, tuna steak, out. Once per week, you can have one of these guys, but these are the go-tos. Okay, so here's what I would recommend for you. I don't think you're going to walk around this lecture um, when you go into a supermarket, but you've got a smartphone with you. So what I would really recommend you do when you go back and you try to pick out which fish you're going to eat, um, let's say, for example, there's a fish you're not familiar with, black sea bass. You can literally go to your cell phone, open up Google, type in black sea bass mercury content, and then look for a .gov, something from the government that's going to tell you true values as far as this is something you should avoid. How often can you eat it? You really don't want to be in the yellow or red category with small children. So if you have small children in your house, avoid these at all costs. But the two to three per week are very good for you. Uh, and you can see down on here as well, tuna, canned light. It hits in the green category. It's just the tuna white albacore or the tuna steak, which is really, really not going to be good for you. This is just some more information from the FDA, which talks about how to avoid tuna and that it is in that category as far as avoid it when you can, especially, again, going back to the tuna steak or the albacore tuna. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was just the idea, again, it's not just really melt and mercury we have to worry about a lot of times with fish. Um, there's also something called PCBs. PCBs also don't readily break down, so they can bioaccumulate a little in the body. They do many bad things. They cause cancer, affect the immune system. And you may think to yourself, maybe it's not a big deal. Uh, these are sources of PCBs, especially transformers, capacitors, any sort of old equipment, before 1970, oils may have PCBs in them. Uh, why do we get concerned about them in our waters, in our in our in our fish? Well, it's because of this. So a bunch of years ago, back uh, you know basically uh, before 1970s, we can see PCBs were made on the Hudson River. So General Electric was upstream, way up in the in the Hudson, way above Albany. You can see Albany here, and this is Poughkeepsie. Uh, they were making PCBs, and uh, a lot of different plants did at the time. Uh, they uh, actually uh, threw their waste into the water. So they put their waste into a river stream, which happens to be the Hudson River, which we know about. And we can see the PCB contaminated sediment moves down, moves down, hits past Albany, gets all the way to that salt front, and, and sometimes escapes as well. There have been multiple efforts to clean this up. There is no really good way to clean it up. It's 
millions or billions of dollars to do the cleanup properly. And at the same time, since a lot of the PCBs now are in the sediment, we're afraid of even touching it because it actually brings that PCBs back up to the, to the water level and fish will consume it. And if the fish consume it, it's in, it's in you as well. So uh, you can always look at uh, the PCB counts and the PCB watches in the Hudson River. A lot of times we just say it's not good to fish uh, and capture. In the Hudson River, it's for game only. So just to sport catch and then throw the fish back because again, trying to avoid PCBs. This is part of a bigger conversation, which we're gonna have with water in module three. And that's the idea as far as what is water? How do we move water? What's inside water? Um, what can we do to make water better for the next generation? What about fish oil and pills then? Okay, so, so if we should avoid fish, uh, should we do that? Well, again, my recommendation and the recommendation in your book is not to avoid fish. Some people will not eat fish because they're vegetarians, vegans, maybe there's another reason. Uh, in reality, these fish oil pills aren't really a good idea. And there, there's one reason for this, all right, more than anything else. First of all, if you take too many of them, you're gonna get an omega-3, omega-6 imbalance. Remember, omega-3s and omega-6s balance inflammation, so clotting and uh, dissociation of the blood clot. So if you're taking too many omega-3s, omega-6s in the wrong ratio, you can have uncontrolled bleeding or hemorrhage in the body. Even more so, fish oil is, is, is a dietary supplement. That means the FDA does not regulate it. So that actually means you don't know what fish they use to get that fish oil. It could be a king mackerel. It could be something else. So you could have methylmercury in the fish oil because it's not a heavily regulated product. You don't know what else they put into it as well. And so again, that's one of those reasons why going back to the good source, the fish itself, looking for the cold water fish, certain uh, criteria, for example, uh, you know, thinking back to oysters or, or anchovies or sardines, those small fish, cold water fish, they're not going to have a lot of mercury in them to begin with. And they're excellent sources of omega-3s and that'll put you in a better position. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed this uh, short lecture on, you know, lipids, but really fatty acids and how omega-3s and omega-6s play a role there. And uh, we'll catch you in the, later in the module. Thanks for your time.